It's a show with two retired detectives that were in the thick of New York crime, fast and hectic. They got some stories and some jokes, even an interview with the most powerful folks. Off the cuff, off the cuff, one episode just ain't enough. Get a little laughter and an interview too. The best thing you can do Wow, that was so cool. That was produced by Angie Eng. Thank you so much, Angie, for that great production. Now we have our own theme song. We had that. We re, we sort of uh, re, uh, reused it, and we got our new video. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Anyway, I'm uh, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, Bill Cannon. I'm a retired 27-year veteran of the NYPD. Uh, with me today, Phil Grimaldi took the day off. He's going to Atlantic City. He's going to offer Mo Green to buy him out for his <laughs> casino, you know? I don't know. I don't know if Mo Green will let him buy him out, but uh, he's going to make the offer. Once he hears he's been smacking around his brother Fredo, he may come back. Man, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I did in all seriousness. I did get a great substitute today uh, for Phil Grimaldi to fill in on the show. And you guys know him. He's a retired NYPD police officer, a great attorney, Joe Murray. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks, Bill. So happy to be here. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Phil's stories when he gets back. <laughs> <laughs> See how he did with buying out Mo Green's casino. I don't know. But, uh, you, you know, some buy of the. me out. I buy you out. I buy you out. That's right. <laughs> Why are you smacking my brother around? <laughs> hey. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, yeah. some of the folks in the on the YouTube channel that are, are, uh, are members, uh, Angie Yang's one of them, Carol Loving Alaska. But some of them asked me to give a shout out to him and how stupid that I don't retired Sergeant Melinda, who's at the level of dipped in butter search and rescue canine mom, polish my rack at that level. The canob polish my rack. Also uh, Joe Kane, my accountant, he's dipped in butter. Joe, thank you so much for being dipped in butter. Joshua is in polish my rack and doc, AKA Matt. He reached out to me and said, how come you never shout out to me? He's the only one in our YouTube membership that's heated dipped in butter. And wow. that's $49.99 a month. So, Doc, oh, I got Matt, upgrade. <laughs> thank you so much, so much for doing that. And, folks, if you're not uh, subscribed to Police Off the Cuff, please do so. Go on our YouTube, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell, give us the thumbs up. So today we're going to be talking. There's not a lot of new stuff, but we're going to talk about some of the stuff that's been transpiring the last few days in the Gabby Petito case. And, of course, the big news was um, that uh, Brian Laundrie's father, Chris, had gone out to, uh, on the search, I'm going to play a short little video here, he had gone out on the search with, with the police and uh, to help them, well, to allegedly help them. We'll, we'll discuss that more and more. And I know Joe Murray's probably going to disagree with me. That's That's why I bring him on the show, you know, because... He's the yin and I'm the yang. The usual twist today in the search for Brian Laundry. Today, see this video here? That is his father, Chris, in the passenger seat there, joining the search. He was seen going into the Myakkahatchee Creek Environmental Park today, where authorities continue to look for his son. Let's go to Fox 13's Kimberly Cuisan, who joins us again live from the park. Hi there, Kim. So why did he join the search today? Hi, Mark. Well, we're told that he joined the search with investigators trying to point them out to areas where Brian was known to frequent and where he was known to hang out within the reserve. This morning, just before 10 o'clock, Brian Laundrie's father, Chris, left his Northport home carrying a plastic bag, dressed in hiking shoes and hiking pants. Just a short drive away, he could be seen on a John Deere golf cart as a Northport police officer drove him into the Myakkahatchee Creek Environmental Park. They went over a bridge leading into the Carlton Reserve. 
My thing is, do you really think he's out there after all this time? They Around the same time, Joe Gallagher was finishing his morning run on the Venice side of the Carlton Reserve as the search for Brian Laundrie continued. Hopefully they'll, they can find something in there to, you know, in the next week or so, but it's just strange. Through text messages, Chris Laundrie's attorney, Stephen Bertolino, said Chris was asked to show law enforcement trails and places where his son was known to frequent. He said he and his wife had provided those details verbally, but it was thought on-site assistance may be better. It's interesting. It's a little confusing. I mean, always in a case like this, whether it's searching for a missing person or a suspect, uh, initially, you want to get the family involved. Ed Hartnett is the founder of Edmund Hartnett Risk Management. He's a retired NYPD deputy chief with 32 years of law enforcement experience. He says law enforcement would welcome the help, but would remember the laundries did not help with Gabby Petito's search. Can't rule out the possibility that there may be legal proceedings against them down the road. If it can be proven later on that they aided and abetted their son uh, in eluding the police in any way. While Laundry's attorney says Chris's involvement didn't uncover anything new, the family is grateful for the chance to help. Not just they want to chat with him and, and talk to him about the case. He's a, he's a wanted suspect right now. Yeah, he's wanted for that debit card fraud. That That's where the warrant is out for his arrest. Uh, but through their family attorney, Chris Laundrie, and the family attorney said that they are thankful for law enforcement's dedication and efforts to find Brian Laundrie. Uh, when asked if anything was found out here today, they said nothing was found. They said that they do hope that Brian is located soon. And we did learn that Chris Laundrie will not be back out here tomorrow. Mark, back to you. All right. I know a lot of us are hoping he'll be located soon for sure. So, Joe, I'm going to give you my take on this, and then I know you can give me your attorney's take, which will probably be 360 degrees uh, from mine. I'm also glad that that was Ed Hartnett. He's been on yeah. this show before. Not Great only guy. is he ret a retired a super guy, not is he only a retired NYPD deputy chief, but he was the police commissioner of Yonkers and a real, real down-to-earth guy, a real stand-up guy. We love him, and uh, if he's listening, Ed, have – it's great to see you on the show. My take for this is um, the uh, the laundries didn't cooperate early on at all. They talked to no one. They all lawyered up. They're all hiding behind lawyer-client privilege. I think this is a clever ruse by their attorney to get them out from under it once they find Brian and they bring him to court. It's It's a preemptive strike to try to get the parents unprosecutable. And that's my um, my position. I think Ed Hartnett sort of suggested that also. But yeah. I know that, Joe, you're an attorney and you're going to totally go the other way. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so as you suspected, I do. I, I, In all seriousness, we're talking about, you know, two young kids, one uh, who disappeared and <clears throat> tragically she was found... Uh, you know, death, dead by homicide. Uh, the other one now has disappeared, 23 years old. So I, I really think when the FBI came to them and asked them for help, we heard in that uh, recording that they provided verbal uh, direction or uh, assistance, but the FBI felt it would be more beneficial if we could bring them out here and show us, and they did it. So I really don't see anything, you know, suspicious of that. And I also want to point out, I know there's a lot of people and you and Phil, and you believe that from the beginning, the parents are involved in this conspiracy to cover up, uh, like what in New York would be the equivalent of a hindering of prosecution, uh, that they're plotting to conceal their son's involvement and escape you know, like out of the country. I, I just don't believe that to be the case. You're talking about them and their attorney now being involved in this grand scheme that they'll all go to prison for a very long time for if it's found to be true. I just don't see it. I really do think what happened is that he, when he came home and, and told them, look, there was so much pressure and so much, uh, you know, media and, and people showing up at the house he wanted to unplug and get off the grid and go out to do what he does. And that's what he does. I think they even planned the trip when he came back. So I don't think that's unusual. He decided 
to find solitude by going out in the uh, preserve. I think what may have happened is while he was out there alone and thinking about everything that went on and everything that happened and everything he did, maybe he decided, I'm not going back. And he either hid or, you know, tried to, to escape himself. I don't think the parents are involved in it. I really don't. Um, I think this shows it that the parents are, or at least the, the father, they were asked by the FBI to provide information. They provided it. Now they were asked to come out and show us, and they did it. So I kind of disagree with you. I, I'm not into that big conspiracy thing. I, I think this was an impromptu thing on his own, or, God forbid, he was you know, attacked or, or some tragedy happened while he was out there, which could happen. I mean, I don't know the grounds in the area, but from the overhead views, it looks like a vast area that you can hide anywhere. So, uh, and then, you know, I'm hearing about alligators. I want none of that. I'm sure that there's a possibility, at least, that he could have been tragically uh, attacked and, you know, maybe dead. But I do think he went out there on his own. He decided, I want to be away. And then perhaps while he was out there, he decided... I'm not going back. You know, I, I, I don't think the parents are involved. Well, Joe, you know, uh, I'm a cop and will be ever will forever be suspicious. I think he's sipping margaritas in Juarez, Mexico, as, as we speak. But I, I think that you can't what, – what, what you said, and I appreciate what you said, could maybe be true if, it, if there was no um, history of September 1st to September 11th when he was home in his parents' home and Gabby was laying dead in the field. And he said nothing to his parents about what happened to Gabby. And nor did the parents, his parents, take calls from Gabby Petito's parents about the whereabouts of Gabby. That is not, it's unforgivable. It's unbelievable that they could not uh, take the calls from Gabby Petito's parents. It's unbelievable that uh, they didn't know where their son was. And all of, for all of those reasons, I do not believe anything that they say. And I think... I, I'll repeat it again. I think it's a clever ruse by their attorney uh, to, to protect them from a future prosecution. I'm going to play another uh, little video from um, Ban Banfield's show on whether or not um, he could survive in this unforgiving terrain. Uh, I'll put that on the screen, and then we'll, we'll play a little bit of this. Welcome back to our special coverage of the Brian Laundry manhunt. For many TV viewers and online followers, you know who you are. Brian Laundry is the most wanted man in America. But the title of television's most hunted man, well, that belongs to a guy named Joel Lambert. A Navy SEAL for 10 years, Lambert was the star of the show Lone Target. In each episode, he had just 48 hours to elude the best fugitive trackers in the world, including the Korean National Police in South Korea and the U.S. Army's Phantom Recon Unit in the Arizona desert. There is nobody in the world more equipped to avoid capture for long periods of time. And so we thought, who better to help find a man on the run like Brian Laundry than the man himself, Joel Lambert. Thank you so much for uh, for being with me tonight, Joel. The, the, I just keep thinking about all the places that, that Brian Laundry could be. And they've been places maybe that you have eluded capture, swamps and, and mountains and, and deserts and forests and even cities. But can you tell me which one is the easiest to get lost in and which one is the easiest to get caught in? Hi, Ashley. Thanks for having me. Well, um, really, the situation always is going to dictate your response. And there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages. There are always trade-offs in any situation that you're in. For instance, the jungle is a very difficult swamps, very difficult um, mine sucking place to be, but there's abundant water and there's generally lots of food that you can find. And it's very easy to get yourself lost and, and conceal a trail. Um, cities, some cities are really easy to get lost in. Others like uh, South Korea, they've got, you know, um, 5,000 CCTV cameras all over the, um, the city with facial recognition technology. So it just depends on the situation um, what is best. I don't know 
what Brian Laundry knows, what his skill sets are, where he's comfortable. Those are the kinds of things that you need to know in order to assess where he's going to be comfortable and where he's not going to be comfortable. Sometimes I, I wonder, Joel, animals. if he's watching us, you know, I, I wonder like if he's watching TV somewhere. But then I saw an episode of you in the Florida Everglades and you were actually really close to the people hunting you. You could even get eyes on them. I want to play that clip and ask you about it on the other side. Take a look. OK. Out here with not a lot of activity. These guys so again, they the camera up. up like a Christmas tree. Normally, I want to keep as much distance between our force and I as I can. But I've got a little friend. This is a remote controlled robot with a manipulator arm and with five or six low light infrared cameras to reconnaissance the area, see where they're at, see how many there are, and just what I'm up against. I also need to find a way to start the hunt without giving away my position. I can see the hunter for us. Oh, I see a lot of gear. Look like they're ready for war. Five people I see so far. I don't know, Joel, something tells me that you're too good at it. I don't think Brian Laundrie would dare get close to people who might be able to spot him. Well, he's not an expert. You are. What do you guess that he's doing? Well, I, I really don't know. What I would want to know if I were on this job is I would want to know all the intelligence I could get from his family, whether that's good or bad. Human intelligence can be some of the best intelligence you can get but it's also unreliable. So you need to mitigate that with all the other things that you know. So, you know, you really need to dig in and try to read this guy's brain and see where he's going to be comfortable, what kind of skill sets he has, because people, you know, we're, we're animals. We can take the path of least resistance. We're going to go to what is most comfortable for us. We're going to go to the easiest route. And so you need to find out what the easiest route is for this guy, where he's most comfortable and then start there. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting you should say that because, you know, there, there were witnesses. We were talking to witnesses uh, and, and they were saying Appalachian Trail. We think, the, you know, we, we, I think we saw him on the Appalachian Trail and he certainly knows the Appalachian Trail. But I was fascinated to watch this episode with you when it was like sometimes, you know, it's not always a bad thing to be spotted. And that threw me for a complete loop. But I'm going to play the moment and the viewers will get what you meant when they see it. Take a look. Human intelligence or, or what people tell you is some of the best intelligence that you can get, but it's also some of the most unreliable. I go in and it conspicuously leave in a deceptive direction. When the hunter force comes through, they're going to ask around and they're going to point them exactly the way I wanted to think I went. All right, guys, coming through. Hi. Oh, man. This is a little more than I was expecting. The first time that uh, I've asked there, they told me that he moved uh, that way. Then the other guys, they, they told me they didn't see anything. As Joel anticipated, human intelligence is unpredictable, yeah. as the villagers all unintentionally give conflicting reports to the ranger. I suspect Brian Laundry is not smart enough to think uh, in advance to do, you know, a bait and switch like you did. But I guess it is a good tactic. Well, it can be in the situation where they didn't know who I was and I was kind of at a blank slate that I could go in and, and create whatever narrative I wanted to. Brian Laundry doesn't have that luxury. He's a wanted man. Whatever kind of deception he's going to be doing, uh, if he's smart, it wouldn't be around any kind of people. Right. Well, OK, so then another thing that I was surprised was when you were uh, being hunted by the Philippine army. You know, we just always assume that militaries have the, the highest falutin gear, right? Heat seeking this and right. uh, extra special that. And these guys had like a flashlight. But what they could do yeah. with that flashlight was nothing short of remarkable. I'm going to play the clip and I'm going to ask you about that after this. Take a look. Okay. This 16-man unit doesn't depend on high-tech assets, but relies solely on their highly tuned tracking skills. The rangers look for Joel's tracks by casting, systematically searching in a circular pattern to locate any sign of spore. <laughs> We cannot see clearly this uh, footprints because there is no direct light on it. But if I'm going to use my flashlight, 
then make a shadow on the footprints. Then I could tell this is a Panama boots, like my boots. This is still fresh. It's heading toward southwest direction. I That's pretty amazing, huh? I mean, wow, I, I, I used to track people like that in New York City on the pavement. You know, I'd have to hold on my <laughs> flashlight. And I could say, yeah, those are Air Jordans they were wearing, you know? <laughs> See? What, I got to say that it was very logical. It made a lot of sense, everything he said. And look what the FBI is doing. I mean, they're going but, with his but, father for where they think he might normally go, his comfort zone. But, but Joe, look, this guy is a Navy SEAL. There's no one out there on this search that has this guy's credentials. Yeah. And I mean, you know, he makes dog look like, you know, a TV a TV yeah, huckster, which is what he is. Yeah. Yeah. So this guy's the real deal. He's, he's a Navy SEAL. But, yeah. you know, he's also saying that, you know, they're very difficult to survive in the terrain that Brian Laundrie is in. Does mm. He doesn't have the survival skills that um, that he has and a lot of other people have. So the question is, then, where is he right now? Is Initially, in, when this case first started, I sort of believed that he was going to kill himself. But then as I learn more and more about the case, I don't feel that he did that. I feel that he's on the run and he's in some, I believe he's somewhere very comfortable right now and he can just stay there for as long as he wants to. So, but you know, it also doesn't make sense. Why did the police and why did the FBI search the Carlton Reserve for so long and spend all the money and all the resources if they really didn't truly believe that he was in there? See, I, I'm sticking with, you know, my my opinion on this. I believe he's there. I believe the parents would tell him the truth. And I believe when the parents said, help, he's missing, and called down the resources of the federal government, the state, the local, to do this massive search, it wasn't to shield his flight. It was to find him. I think they genuinely wanted to find him. You know, I know a lot of people think that, you know, they had arranged to sneak him out of the country by then. I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, crossing our borders is, is not an easy thing to do. It can be done. But somebody like him, I mean, his face is everywhere. So for people not to pick up on that, I, I just don't find this to, to make any sense. Well, you know, this slide that's on the screen right now, this is from early on in the investigation. And uh, the Navy SEAL we just uh, heard uh, he said sometimes them seeing you or reporting to see you can actually help you get away. Right. Uh, yeah. And on this one, it says police searching for Brian Laundrie have found a fresh campsite in T. Mabry Carlton Jr. Memorial Reserve. But was that campsite his campsite? They would have to, you know, test it for DNA. They don't know for fact. I don't know what he left behind. And then uh, early on, Laundrie's abandoned Ford Mustang was found near the entrance to the reserve. In September, and I believe that the parents put that there. They drove him there, and they mm -hmm. put that there for an escape car, and then it was left there. So I think there's a lot of things that we don't know about this, and I know that you don't you don't agree with me. So I, I'm just, um, but I believe the parents were intricately involved in his escape plan. And you know, I mean, you remember the Martha Stewart case, you know, you can't lie to federal officers about a material fact, you know, this is something that is going to end them in prison just for that one statute. Yeah, but but Joe, they're not getting interviewed. They're not sitting down in a formal interview. We don't interview. know that. We don't know that to be the case. I, I mean, well, I would have met Joe this, if that attorney they said that he he gave information about where he goes and his trails. And then they asked him to come out and show us. I mean, that's yeah, but how can they, how could they possibly prove that to be a lie? He's just saying something that yeah, he used to go here. He likes peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. How 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 are they going to disprove that? I'm sure that? that this was not the the entire scope of their interview. I think they are speaking. When I heard Cassie talk about, you know, she has spoken to the FBI and they asked her not to reveal that. I think there is cooperation going on. I know initially. There wasn't, and I I really, I don't want to say blame the attorney, but I would give the same advice. A principal cannot talk to anyone. I tell my clients, don't even talk to your family because they could be called into a grand jury. 
You can't talk to anyone but me. That's the only confidential conversation, me and your priest. That's it. So I, it would have been my advice. Don't talk to them, particularly the Petito family, because you know how awkward that is and horrible it is. You want to console them, but there's going to be questions, and who knows what they say if it gets twisted around and, and, and say something that perhaps they shouldn't have said. I just don't think it's fair to blame them. They sought legal advice, and the attorney gave them good advice. Talk to no one. So I, I, I don't know. I don't think it's as bad as everyone makes it out to be. But, Joe, I think that, you know, again, I'll bring you back to September 1st to September 11th when no one reported Gabby Petito missing, no one from the Laundry family. And to me, that's an egregious um, faux pas. It's an egregious uh, you know, omission to not do that. And I can't forgive that. And I can't believe that they're honest people when they did that. And I can't believe that uh, Brian Laundry is, in fact, innocent. That's why he's on the run. That's why he invoked counsel. And, right. you know, they, they didn't they didn't even uh, know that she, that, that she was dead when he initially came home, you know. So but once they found that out and then he disappears, I think that just speaks volumes about about this case. You know, we had spoken off the air about um, the homicide or, or the murder. And we all know homicide simply means death caused by another. And as there are, there are potential times when a homicide doesn't have to be criminal. It could be accidental. It could be ruled a homicide, but yeah. the death could be accidental. However, in this case, it it has it's been ruled a homicide, but has not yet been called a murder because they don't have the cause of death yet, or they they have it, they just haven't released it. Mm. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, I I I've been wrestling with this, and you know, I am not that uh, fond of the federal government and the FBI and the way they're handling this, and the fact they brought that. Uh, indictment of the unauthorized access device, I was so critical of them because if I was representing him, I would be in constant contact with him and would have surrendered him at the request of the government right away and made my application that he should be released. It's not, it's not even a violent crime. And then I would have demanded all this discovery that actually pertains to the whole investigation, including the homicide. So, and they'd have to turn that over because I'm sure the same people were working on this, you know, both cases. So I thought it was very foolish of the federal government. I'm thinking back, how could they be so sloppy to do this? And then I thought perhaps because we still haven't heard about the autopsy and, you know, what, what they believe happened and, and cause of death, I said, you know, perhaps is it possible that they presented both cases to a grand jury because they're really kind of separate uh, incidents, like the credit card use was not even the same jurisdiction. I imagine it was on the way home. So it, it, it may not pertain to the homicide at all. Perhaps they indicted that on a separate indictment and then indicted the homicide or murder on another indictment but if you look at the docket and what what the the u.s attorney filed uh coincidentally his name's murray too but no relation he <laughs> filed a motion to seal it and it was sealed and the very next day he filed a motion to unseal it and i was critical of that saying look at these guys they don't know what they're doing and in their motion to unseal it their reason for it is that law enforcement indicated to them it would be more beneficial for the search if they unsealed this. So, you know, grand juries are secret proceedings. Nobody gets to know who's there, who the witnesses are, anything. What the indictment, if there's an indictment, it's automatically sealed by application of the government. And they usually don't unseal it until they make the apprehension. In this case, they did the customary, get the indictment, have it sealed. But the next day, they unsealed the credit card one, the unauthorized access device. Perhaps they just did that and left the murder indictment sealed. 
you know, because I was like, why would they do that? They'd have to disclose the Brady material, all this other stuff. Perhaps once they apprehend him, they wanted to show the public, we are working on this. He is now a wanted suspect. They didn't want to reveal the, the homicidal murder charge, uh, and, but it's there. So it, it could potentially be there. I don't understand why we don't have a cause of death, time of death, all the normal things you would get out of you know the autopsy. Uh, but that could be it because it's now a matter of an indictment that's been sealed. Now, Joe, just explain to our audience. I don't know if they all know this, and I'm not saying uh, that, that they're just they, they're not educated with this. But explain to them what discovery is. Discovery is, you know, when they bring a case, you have a due process right to know what the evidence is that's going to be brought against you. So. You know, we make an, a, a demand for it, but the government usually turns it over anyway. So we'll get whatever that material is that they intend to use at trial. You know, defense attorneys, we would call it trial by ambush because for the longest time, we wouldn't get discovery until right before that witness was testifying. You know, then they will turn over their grand jury minutes or some other information and we're scrambling to try to figure out what it is and what it means. It's horrible. We should know that early on and right away. So now that's part of some of the forms that, that have been coming out. We get early discovery. We get it right away. And it's really unfair when you think about it that someone should have to make a decision on whether or not they pl take a, a, a plea to a charge without even knowing what the evidence is against them. You know, so, so that's a good thing that we're now getting discovery a lot quicker. Well, you know, I know that used to be a strategy that district attorneys would use um, to sort of thwart your defense. And you would walk in prepared for the first day of trial and they would hand you uh, yeah, stack of five, five, 500 words of, uh, of, of discovery material. And right away, yeah. the defense attorney would say, Judge, I just got this now. I've requested <laughs> adjournment for two or three months because I, I can't read this. All you know by tomorrow. Sometimes it's it after you pick the jury. I mean, how do you pick a jury without knowing your defense strategy? And then all of a right. sudden they dump this on you, you know, that you have this material. So it's right. really we call it trial by ambush. They just dump it on you at the last minute. Now you're trying to figure out your defense, you know, what it means to your defense. So that's horrible, but I, that's changed, you know. But don't another forget, thing it's a balancing though, because we have to protect the victim, we have to protect witnesses. So I think what had happened in New York City is they went overboard. They said, give them everything in 15 days. That's not appropriate. I don't think that's right. Uh, you know, think about it. If a woman is raped in her house, you know, they now have to allow the, the perpetrator to go back into her house, into her bedroom, the perpetrator himself, not just the defense attorney, to examine the crime. Yeah, that, that's that, that's outrageous. That's it, it, outrageous. You know, where is the victim's rights here? So that, right. it's a that's, balancing. I understand the defense rights, but also victims are just being trampled now. You know, Joe, I wanted to mention another thing also for our audience. Um, the FBI has a, a, sp a special code that if you lie to them in an interview and they can prove that, they can arrest you. No other law enforcement agency... Uh, I don't. Does the DEA have that? The uh, the other federal agencies have that law. Yeah, federal agents. The federal all law. federal agents. So yeah. if you lie to a federal agent, you can be arrested for lying. You can lie to a New York City cop till the end of time, and he can't arrest you for that. Well, but what do you feds, think about that? And I'm kind of curious as to what people think. Should you be allowed to lie? I mean, you know, materially lie about something, not just you know. Oh, I, I forgot or I exaggerated or something, you know, a material lie. Should you be allowed to lie to any law enforcement during an investigation? I think it's somewhat of a deterrent. In this case, I think, you know, not Gabby's case, but the current status of it, I think it's, it's being weaponized and abused and perjury traps and things like that. But I'm curious as to what people think. Do you think you should be allowed to sit there and lie to a law enforcement officer without consequence. Joe, having been a law enforcement officer for 27 years, I find that power to be uh, a power that can be abused beyond yeah, reason. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that the FBI does abuse that power. And you notice when they interview a politician, 
they never put that politician under oath. Yes, right. So the politicians just lie with impunity. And uh, you saw you saw some FBI agents lying with impunity being interviewed by Congress because they weren't under oath either. So Incredible. does it work for everyone? Is that law for everyone or just for the small people? You know, well, it's it's prosecutorial discretion. It's up to the actual prosecutor's office to bring a case. It's not, you know, mandatory in every case. But and I think that's what we're seeing. The government justice is supposed to be blind. Lady Justice wears a blindfold. It shouldn't matter who you are, what color you are, what what party you're affiliated with. It should be equal treatment under the law. And more and more, we're seeing that's not the case. Well, Joe, I think a lot of people that listen to police off the cuff and listen uh, to duty, Ron, they've learned a lot about the law that they cannot believe the protections that an accused gets. Yeah. And of course, if you're ever accused, you want those protections because the power of government and specifically the federal government is awesome. And they have unlimited resources to go after you. And I mean, there was a, a statue that really spelled the end of the mafia as we know it. And that statue was called Rico. Rico. Yeah. And Rico just decimated. Uh, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but right. that statue destroyed the Italian mafia as we know it. Because yeah. instead of someone, someone facing 10 years, they were facing 50 years or life without parole. Thus, what occurred was these guys accused were flipping and, you know, they became what was the worst thing you could possibly become in La Cosa Nostra, and that was a rat. Yeah. But rather than go to prison for the rest of their life, life without parole, they were like, hey, I'm flipping. You know, and they always like to say, I'm I'm cooperating. They didn't like the term rat. They would say, I'm yeah. a cooper I'm a cooperating yeah. witness, you know. So yeah, that's a that's a, a very powerful thing to be able to arrest someone for lying. And I I mean I'm not sure I like it uh, because yeah, I think, I mean, I'm kind of on the fence with that. I mean, I like the fact that people, you know, you're perpetrating a fraud on the police coming in and giving false statements and sending them a different direction. So I think there should be some deterrence, but the federal government, the way, you know, unfortunately in these high profile cases like General Flynn, we see how they use it as a perjury trap to come in, tell us something so we can now bang you with that and try to get you to, you know, cooperate or do something else, you know? So I, I, I'm so conflicted on it. I don't like it. The, 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 the current application of it right now, uh, I think it's horrible. You know, I, I, agree I don't with you. think people should be allowed to go in and materially lie, wasting, like, look at this, the Brian Laundry case, how many millions of dollars, are being wasted if he's not in that preserve and they're reporting that that's where he is that's the last play and that's where you search the police start you know okay that's where he what you start at home but that's you know where he said he was going and and where they led him to with the car so i i mean if they lied about that that's an enormous enormous cost to us the people the taxpayers you know doing that so I think that uh, we have to strike a balance, maybe not a criminal sanction, but a civil sanction or something. You shouldn't be allowed to. You know, Joe, let me just let me just talk about something from a police point of view. We used to get a lot of people coming in, especially Manhattan special victims. I used to work in the same office as them. And they would get a lot of people coming in filing false reports, yeah. false rape reports. And the manpower it took uh, when it wasn't true to disprove it was you're talking anywhere from eight to 16 hours of investigative work to prove that it wasn't true. And I'm not saying rape reports uh, most of the time they are true, but there was a, a percentage of them that weren't. And usually they, there were certain things that rang the bell or lit a light bulb went off and said, this isn't true. So they would spend you know, anywhere from eight to 16 hours disproving this. Yeah. And the policy became once they disproved it, well, they would take the report. And if they disproved it wasn't true, they would arrest you for filing a false report. Mm -hmm. And once that word got out into the community that, oh, don't do that, because if you file a false report, you're going to get arrested. That started uh, a snowball of them not 
filing false reports anymore. So it was effective. So yeah, then may, maybe this, in the same vein, lying to the police, if there was some teeth in the law, but it, it's too awesome a power, I think, for the government to have to, to misuse it. I, I, I know exactly what you're saying, and I, I agree with you. The one thing that I'm concerned with, because I know they do do these prosecutions, but they do them very sparingly, and they have to be like really bad cases or obvious false statements that were disproven, because it has a chilling effect on the public and potential victims who, if they hear so-and-so is charged with making a false allegation, that the fear is if I'm unable to prove my case and it's my word against his, that they're going to lock me up and that will deter people from coming forward. So I would be concerned about bringing those prosecutions, even though I believe they are false reports, I'd be afraid to deter people coming forward with legitimate, you know, complaints of sexual abuse or uh, sex crimes, because they're now thinking if I'm unable to prove this, I'm going to jail. You know, I mean, you got to wait. Right. No, well, I, I don't want to totally dig deep into that. Just that was their policy. Kathleen Thorpe, Joe and Bill, could the police or FBI have listening devices in the laundry's house? I think that was answered a couple of episodes ago by Judge Patricia Domango from uh, the TV show Hot Bench when she was on our show. And I asked her, would she sign a warrant for an eavesdropping device off to tap their phones? And she said, absolutely not. So there's your answer. I think that was answered pretty well. Um, well, I mean, she's speaking from a state perspective, and I agree with that. I don't think it warrants it. I mean, you have to really demonstrate that no uh, uh, customary investigative tactics can otherwise you know, be successful, that this is the only way we're going to get information. Like it's, it's a high, high burden, but the federal government, I think it's a, a lot easier to get, you know, title three wires. And uh, I don't, I just don't know what they have. And if they had something significant showing contact, then I think they would get it and would actually go to get it because it's, you know, something that they do, you know, quite often. Um, you know, I just want to point out, because you mentioned, too, about the, the force and power of the federal government. I think I, I mentioned this on one of your uh, prior shows. I had a client who was, you know, when you're charged in a state case, um, it's people state of New York or people state of whoever against the defendant. But when you're charged federally, it says the United States of America versus Brian Laundrie. You know, so I had a client, I think I was on the phone, he was in my office and we were going up and I hear him looking at the indictment and reading it and he's reading it out loud and he's like, the United States of America versus, you know, his name, Joe, let's just say Joe Murray. And he was like, damn, is the whole country against me? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty intimidating if you see the all 50 states are against you. <laughs> the whole country is against me. And I said to him, I said, you know what? That's a great way to put it because, yes, they have unlimited resources and they will pursue you with this prosecution to no end, you know? So, uh, but yeah, that was significant because the government is all powerful. And sadly, the framers put in so many checks and balances to prevent this from happening it was supposed to be the states had all the power except for these enumerated powers they were giving to the federal government. But little by little, they exploited clauses in the Constitution like the Commerce Clause. That is the most exploited clause in, in the Constitution that allows them to reach their hand into state uh, issues that they ordinarily would not be involved in. So uh, I, I do think that we need to, I mean, people need to be educated about and see the progression and maybe push back a little on that. Anyway, that's my politics. Well, I like that, Joe. Uh, folks, if you're not subscribed to Police Off the Cuff, please go on our YouTube, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell, give us a thumbs up. Uh, we have a Patreon and we also have a membership. I can see the folks that are in the green uh, font. Uh, the mystery maven. Yes, I totally agree with that statement on the Commerce Clause. 
There's a lot of people that agree with you, Joe. Someone else wanted to know if you are licensed to uh, practice in other states. People want to hire you in other states, Joe. You know, I don't you know. know. Federal court is federal court. You can get into other federal jurisdictions because it's federal law. You know, it's, it's applicable everywhere. State courts, especially like different state bars, you can wave into or like I have a case now. I was invited to work on this appeal. A great case, a homicide, wrongful conviction in Massachusetts. And there's something called Pro Hoc Vice where you can just make application to get in there. You have to get local. Oh, Joe, I, Joe, I love when you speak Latin. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so does Anne. She says that too. So, uh, so, yeah, it allows you into any jurisdiction that has, like, reciprocal. So if we allow them into New York, they'll allow us into Massachusetts. So, yeah, you you can for specific cases. And But I am not licensed anywhere else. I was applying for Washington, D.C., because I was invited to help out with that January 6th debacle that's going on there. They're all in solitary confinement, protesters that, you know, previously they talked about the Black Lives Matter protesters as peaceful as they caused millions of dollars in damage and people died at these things, too. I'm just confused as to why they're different, you know, with with one set of protesters over another. But that will leave for another day. Yeah, uh, single mom of four. I also miss Phil. Hey, don't miss him for one day. He's going to get a little cocky <laughs> if people start missing Phil. Uh, he's gone for one night, you know, uh, because we we got the great Joe Murray here. In fact, I'm going to um, do Joe Murray's. I'm going to read Joe Murray's commercial. Uh, this is like a kick in the butt. He's here, and I'm reading his commercial. <laughs> Folks, if you get in any kind of trouble, you need a great defense attorney who's also uh, was a, is a retired NYPD police officer. Joe Murray is an excellent attorney, and uh, you can get him on his website at Joe Murray, Joe Mur J Murray dash law dot com. Uh, his cell phone number is 718 514 3855. Email Joe at J Murray dash law dot com. He also has a website, J Murray dash law dot com. He's becoming somewhat of a uh, YouTube sensation. We gotta, we gotta knock him down a few pegs, you know. He's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna take over the YouTube world. But he's, you made I love me. How, you created me. I, 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 yeah, I created Joe Murray. I don't know about that, but I think he's, uh, he's very popular for a reason. He's very smart. He's very personable, and people uh, like to listen to him. You know, I, I think we, you know, we're gonna follow this case. There's so many uh, moving parts in this case, as there are in most cases, but. We wanted to touch upon, uh, we haven't um, spoken about it uh, in, in, a, in a while, and that's the, um, the um, Summer Wells case. And uh, I think that Don Wells has been making the rounds uh, lately uh, on some of the TV shows. And I'm just going to play a little bit of him appearing on a, a recent show, and we'll get this on the screen. Uh, we we almost forgot about this case, it seems, but uh, it's sort of back in the, let me just start it from the beginning. Seeing Hawkins County five-year-old Summer Wells is now addressing his daughter's disappearance, the investigation into her whereabouts, and social media rumors hindering search efforts. New at five, for the first time in months, Donald Wells spoke with Ansley Daniels. Have there been any Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing at all. Don Wells hasn't seen his daughter since June 15th. My boss never gave up faith in me, and uh, so I'm still here. In the months since, he's tried to catch up with work while also looking for summer. Every once in a while, I call TBI and talk to one specific person, and, you know, he tells me they're still checking on a lot of things and stuff, and he says... You know, with all this stuff that's happened on social media, it's just bogged them down. As the TBI has combed through more than a thousand tips, there have been no credible leads on where his five-year-old could be. And authorities are still looking for a potential witness that was driving a red or maroon Toyota truck with a full bed ladder rack. That truck was seen in the area around the time Summer disappeared. Now, Don says he's concerned that truck is no longer in the area or could have been altered. They've had plenty of time to change Everything, you know, a lot of things, you know, get rid of the truck, change up the appearance of it, or, you know, all you have to do is take the ladder rack off or, or whatever, and 
you know, don't take much. A private investigation company is also now assisting. They're there for us. They're good people. Uh, they're just wanting to help find Summer, and that's their number one goal. Don says the social media frenzy that's hindered search efforts is also impacting his family. It's been horrific. Uh, like I say, you know, on top of our daughter being abducted, you know, we turned to social media, which was hoping that that could help us find our daughter and everybody come up, you know, theorizing and all kind of stuff. It just, it just got really bad. Despite everything, he says they're trying to keep faith that Summer will be found. Are you losing hope? Well, losing hope. Well, yeah, I wonder if I'll ever see her again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to lose hope, but yeah, I guess, you know, I guess I am losing hope that I'll ever see her again. But yeah, I pray for her all the time, you know, and hope. I hope that she comes back. Yes. But I wonder. Yeah. When asked about Summer's older brothers who were earlier confirmed to be in Child Protective Services custody, all uh, Don Wells would say is, quote, the boys are safe and doing good. Let's take one more look at Summer. If you think you've seen this little girl or you know anything that could help investigators, please call 1-800-TBI-FIND. Tough case, Joe. You know, and we covered that a great deal uh, in the beginning. She's been missing now for four months. Uh, we all gave our opinions on it. Many of us uh, thought that Don Wells had something to do with it. And, uh, you know, it's 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 a heartbreaking case. as a five-year-old girl missing. And uh, at this point, it doesn't seem like there's a great deal of progress on this case. But again, we're not privy to the internal investigation they have uh, Tennessee Bureau of Investigations, Hawkins County, and the FBI are all on this case. Yeah, you know, Ronnie Lawson, the sheriff of Hawkins County, he actually made a statement about kind of updating the status of the investigation. Uh, that same news channel covered it. And what he said essentially is that everyone involved in this case is still a suspect. He did confirm that that trail... I don't know if you want to call it like the dogs followed Summer's trail right to the street, but lost it there. And he actually went on to say that sometimes they will lose when they change terrain, you know, going from, I guess, that that pathway down to the gravel and then the street. Uh, they sometimes do do that. They, they'll lose it. So uh, that was a concern. And he also confirmed they are still looking for that red Tacoma. So, you know, everyone is saying Don's a liar and he's responsible. You know, perhaps it's because I was wrongfully accused. I was accused of a crime, a violent crime, as a matter of fact. But I had two juries exonerate me and people still felt that I was responsible and guilty. And so I kind of sympathize where they're at. There's really no evidence pointing to him being responsible, except for these ridiculous YouTube interviews that I saw um of you know that people were trying to twist and turn things i don't think that was appropriate here we have the sheriff of hawkins county who's saying everyone is a suspect they're not naming anyone in particular but more importantly they didn't exculpate anyone and we know that they had you know polygraph tests and and other things there was something else that he mentioned in that interview that there were it was reported I don't know who, if it was Don or Candace, that a neighbor heard screams, like muffled screams. And he says, yeah, that was a couple of months ago, but I think that was uh, turned out to be not true. So right. I don't know. I'm still, you know, I, I, I have not made a decision, but I'm holding the door open on this abduction thing because of what Ronnie is saying right now. Uh, uh, Ronnie, Sheriff Lawson is saying right now, he's saying that that trail going to he confirmed that trail going to the street of summer was a good trail but and then they lost it there and they're still looking for this red tacoma he kind of dispelled you know he says look don is saying there's drug dealers all over there. he says no more than anywhere else and it's a dead end road so you know he kind of like questioned the abduction theory because why else would somebody go there it's a dead end road 
So I don't know, but I, I still don't want to rule out, you know, something like that. Somebody kidnapped her or took her because the police aren't ruling it out. But but YouTube and everyone else has convicted this guy and they want to stone him to death. And I I'm sympathetic over that because I went through something like that. You know, Joe, I, I think that I, I sort of went that way against uh, Don Wells from the very beginning, and I, I still believe he's involved. But um, not having, again, we've said this a million times, not having access to the case folder, to the interviews, to any of the evidence, it's difficult to make an, an educated hypothesis on this. Yeah. We don't have that much time left. I wanted to just go quickly to the Murdoch case, and I'm going to play this quick uh, video on it. Well, you, can, you can comment on this when it's... Uh whose wife and son, as you know, were killed in June, is now accused of taking millions on a wrongful death settlement. Amy Robach, come on now, joins yeah. us now. With us. There's always something in this so case. So many twists, seen. so many turns, guys. Robin, good morning to you. And the money, yes, $4.3 million worth was supposed to come from Alec Murdoch's insurance company. Instead, new court papers are alleging he diverted that money to himself. This morning, another twist in that South Carolina unsolved double murder mystery. Alec Murdoch, whose wife Maggie and son Paul were brutally murdered back in June, is now accused of honchoing a scheme to funnel millions of dollars that were supposed to be paid to the sons of his former housekeeper in a wrongful death lawsuit after she reportedly tripped over his dogs, hit her head, and passed away. They were never told of the settlements. They were never told of the court hearings. They were never told of the disbursements. According to court documents, Murdoch allegedly worked with two of his friends, an attorney and a banker, to pocket money from the $4.3 million settlement, which should have gone to the family of his former housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. The attorney for the housekeeper's family says they've seen a fraction of what they're owed. They want to know what happened to the money. They have to answer for what they did. It is a tremendous stain on the justice system in our state. I'm confident that at the end of this, truth will always come out. Now, Murdoch is also being sued by his former law firm, which was founded by his great-grandfather in the early 1900s. Murdoch resigned from the firm in September after being accused of funneling money he allegedly stole from the firm and their clients into a bank account for his own personal use for years. The firm saying it wants to recover money he stole from the firm and clients of the firm. Murdoch's lawyer calling the lawsuit a very sad development, saying that Murdoch has pledged his full cooperation to the firm. According to his attorneys, Murdoch, who has been indefinitely suspended from practicing law, is currently in an undisclosed rehab facility battling opioid addiction. All right. He briefly left to face a judge last month after police say he hired a hitman and tried to stage his own murder on the side of a road with the intent of committing insurance fraud so his surviving son could collect his $10 million insurance policy. If anyone wants to see the face of what opioid addiction does, you're looking at it. And police still have no official suspects in the murder of Alex's wife and his youngest son. And we should point out authorities are now looking into the death of the housekeeper, which had initially been ruled an accident. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, we, we've spoke about that case a million times, and it's, yeah. it's, baff it's baffling how many different things have gone on in that case. There's at least five bodies in that case, right? Yeah. Five deaths involved in that Murdoch case. and. You know, when his lawyer said, if you want to see the face of opioid addiction, look at this. I mean, everyone is so unsympathetic to him because, yeah. you know, he's destroyed his family, he stole money from his own law firm. He just stole the money from this poor woman who fell down in his house. He stole the money from her family, $4.3 million, and conspired with a banker and another attorney. It's like this case could be, a, you know, a, a television series, not even, you know... You, you're familiar with it. I think most of all yeah, listeners absolutely. are familiar. It, you know, that as soon as I hear reports like this, you know, I, I think of that saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The, this firm and this family have been in power for so long, you know, and uh, I think we're just scratching the surface with this Satterfield case about conduct. You know, you've always said on the show, the best predictor of future behavior is past conduct. Look at this. Well, I mean, I think yeah. they should be looking at other cases, you know, and now we're talking about bank fraud. There was someone involved in the bank. Uh, so I hope that 
of all the cases where the FBI does overreaching, like this is one because you're dealing with a public officer. Attorneys are officers of the court, uh, public integrity. There's a public integrity unit with the FBI. I think because of the conflict of interest that may exist with all, you know, that family being so powerful and solicitors for generations, this calls for federal intervention. And I hope they're doing a thorough investigation of this family because I just got a funny feeling that this is just scratching the surface. You know, Joe, uh, you're so right. And, uh, you know, we promised our, uh, I like to call them our fans. Some of them only like to be called subscribers, whichever one you like. I like the, the term fan uh, for, for the support you're giving police off the cuff, real crime stories. You folks that are in the chat um, that are missing Phil, it's it's all right. He'll be back very soon. All right. And I tonight I, I had a uh, very capable and very smart and very handsome substitute guest for him, attorney and retired police officer Joe Murray. So I thought I would satisfy you guys, but there's still people in the chat that uh, that are missing Phil. You know, and Phil's got Phil. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Phil's got a, Phil's got a life. He's he's allowed to go out every once in a while. Uh, so you know, we uh, we and gave I would him the night try off. Trying to replace Phil Grimaldi. Yeah. I mean, he's one of a kind, and uh, I love being on the show with him too because we get into it too. That that's absolutely correct. You know, folks, I just want to uh, say, uh, say that, uh, again, if you're not a subscriber to Police Off the Cuff, uh, please uh, please do so. Hit that subscribe button, ring that bell for future episodes, and, um, you know, join us. Join the Police Off the Cuff Real Crime family. Joe, any final words before we say goodbye? You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the country. I'm so glad to be able to have the opportunity to try to educate people on our government, our dual sovereignty, state and federal. There's so much happening. So I encourage everyone to be tuned in. Uh, read the Constitution. Look at the history of how this was designed. You know, states were the most powerful under the Constitution originally, state governments, and they would vote together, the state legislators from each state, if they were aligned on an issue. Now it's purely federal party lines. Look at the votes now. Everything is party line federally. They're not allegiance to our states. It's the federal government. The power has flipped. It needs to go back to the states and the people. So that's part of what I love about that I could sneak in some of these things and now they want to change the flag, you know? So I love that people are engaging and learning, but we need to vote and get involved in what's happening. This is our country, you know? So thank you. You know, 100%. You know, folks, before I end, I'm going to just show everyone our new um, promotional video, and then we'll end with the promotional video. But uh, I won't come on after the promotional video, video, so I just want to say thank you guys so much for uh, watching. <laughs> show with two retired detectives that were in the thick of New York crime fast and hectic. They got some stories and some jokes, even an interview with the most popular folks. Off the cuff, off the cuff, one episode just ain't enough. Get a little laughter and an interview too. Maybe the best thing you can do Folks, have a great night. From Police Off the Cuff, Bill Cannon and Joe Murray. Have a great day. Bye now.